Preacher play, you tell me. Let me tell you something. I don't care what hell is breaking loose around you. Hell could be around you, but hell don't gotta be in you. But um, and God's gonna continue opening those doors. He's gonna fulfill His word. And so, if can we just stand to our feet in honor for the man of God that's coming? And uh, we're gonna receive God's man. This is God's man right now for a message for you. Can we just clap unto the Lord and, and, and just invite up the man of God? Thank you. Remain standing. Lift your hands. I want to invite you back to what church was like prior to the day of Pentecost. Something that the apostles understood. That the early church understood until Constantine got involved and created a stage. Can you guys just sing something? Whatever you feel. The early church, before the day of Pentecost, something that the apostles understood was they would do a circle dance of love. They would dance. They would greet one another with a holy kiss. There would be a prophetic word. There would be an exhortation. And then they'd go back into the dance. There'd be a prophecy. There'd be another word. And this went on every day. And then when the day of Pentecost happened, it was something that the apostles understood. And it's how the church was birthed. That's why it went day to day from house to house and then temple to temple every day. Cry out to him. Cry out to him. Oh. Come on, there's glory in the room. Shanda Kanaba Shanda Roto Shanda Bayate Honda Rosi Honda Rosi Honda Rosi Come on, begin to dance with him. Begin to dance with him. Dance with him. Dance with him. He's the greatest dance partner you've ever had. Ho! Start the throne, celestial honor, glory and power. 
Stop. Don't stop. There's so much in this room right now. I've been asking the Lord, Prophet, where to even start. Because there's so much in the room. I'm going to start right here. Woman of God, you have the heart of a lion. And all during worship, I kept watching you. And there's a roar on the inside that's just waiting to come out. So I'm about to hand you this mic, and you're going to shout like you've never shouted before. And when you do, something's going to break off of you that's been trying to limit and to quiet your shout. Amen? So one, two, three.
man of God. You're not just a keyboardist. Open your mouth and prophesy. You're not just a keyboardist. Open your mouth and prophesy. And last night, the Lord was dealing with me about you. And I was waiting. I was like, Lord, do I do it now? And when Prophet Craig come and said he, he, that you guys were going to have a daughter, I was like, okay, Lord, now I know when. I know how, now I know why. I impart into you right now in the name of Jesus the spirit of a father. When my wife got pregnant, I did not know how to be a dad because I never had one that showed me. And I fell on my face and I said, Lord, I don't know how to do this. I need you. Lord, I need you. And when she gave birth, February 9th, 1999, my world changed. And I went to the school of the Holy Ghost on being a dad. In March 19, 2002, my other son was born. The mistakes that I made in the first three years, I was like, Lord, I don't want to make these same ones. Father, teach me your heart. Give me your heart. That was my prayer. And now I'm so blessed and pleased with my own two sons going further than I'll ever go in ministry. So I speak the spirit of fatherhood over you, the true heart of a daddy, true heart of a daddy. And not just your own natural children, but the spiritual sons and daughters in the mighty name of Jesus. Anybody can give birth to a child, but it takes a great anointing to be a great man of God, to be a dad, to be a father. So I declare the spirit of fatherhood over you in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. You'll prophesy over your children. I said children, not child. You'll prophesy over your children. You'll speak life to their destiny. You'll speak life to their destiny in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Don't spectate. Continue to press in. I'm just going to wait on the Lord. I have three sermons tonight. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm just going to obey the Lord. I've quit caring about what people think a long time ago. It's probably why I got excommunicated from a denomination. That's okay. Aren't you glad that it isn't man that calls you? That's the thing about Elijah and Elisha. Elijah said to him, what are you doing? I didn't call you. Basically, it's what he said. God, uh, Elijah didn't call Elisha. God called Elisha. And what God mantles, man can't touch. Jesus. Prophet Craig and Pastor Lauren, last week, I was praying, praying for this weekend, this week, and praying for things going on in our own lives, in our own ministry, and the Lord gave me this weird vision. At first, I was like, Lord, are you trying to sweeten me up a little bit? Because when I tell you the vision, and the Lord said, it's not about you. <laughs> it, and he gave me your faces. 
you have to excuse my voice. I've been fighting some horrible allergies in Jesus' name, but that's got to go. And in this vision, that's why I know I'm middle-aged because I dream and have visions. <laughs> I'm not young and I'm not old. Yeah. In this vision, I'm sitting in my recliner just worshiping the Lord, and I get this vision of this huge honey pot pouring, but then a, a vial of hot sauce mixing together. And as it's flowing down, it creates a lava stream that's sweet and spicy. And it travels, and people that come by are like, I don't know if I like it, it's sweet, but it's spicy. <laughs> I don't know if it's my flavor, but they couldn't stop coming. And in, in the flow of this lava stream of honey and hot sauce, it didn't care where it was going because no one was in control of it. It was burning wherever the Lord wanted it to burn. And so I told Pastor Darnell, I honor him. We've been rolling together since 1994. Yeah, we've been, been through it all together. But I told him, I said, we got to go by the store because I, now I've got some habanero pepper sauce and I'm going to give that to you. <laughs> and I'm going to give you the honey. But there's times y'all think she's really sweet and she comes with it and she's a little spicy. Go ahead. And there's times, there's times, there's times you come to him, afraid to come to him because you think he's going to burn you and he comes across real, real sweet. Now the two of these together is sweet spice. And this lava stream with what you guys are doing, what prophet, I mean, what apostle said last night is true. You won't be here long because this stream is going to go where God desires it to go. I know I haven't asked you this, but are you guys thinking about starting a school of ministry? That's going to happen. If God's been, you've been faithful with raising up interns. Come here, man. This is what I want you to do. I want you to lay hands on your prophet and your pastor, and I want you to speak over them. Who, me? Yeah, you. Can you do that? Are you in tune with the Holy Spirit right now? Get it. <laughs> Come on, pray over them. Pray over them. Extend your hands. This is hot. This is sweet spice. You never know what you're going to get with them. But you're going to get it. Sweet <laughs> Oh. Downloads from heaven right now in Jesus' name. Downloads from heaven. Not afraid at all to take a step. Not afraid at all to take a step. There will be no lack in their ministry and in their life at all. No lack in their ministry at all in the mighty name of Jesus. You've been writing stuff down? Have you been writing stuff down in a notebook? You haven't? Why? God's given you stuff, hasn't he? Write it down. My phone is beside my bed every night because it's my alarm clock. Not that I need it. it go, I wake up early anyway. But 
God gives me dreams. Sometimes at weird hours. And I wake up and I immediately put it in my notes. Some of them are really weird, like honey and hot sauce. (laughs) My favorite verse of scripture is Psalms 115, verse 3. He is God, he is in heaven, and he does as he pleases. So if he wants to give you a dream of honey and hot sauce or a vision, then praise God. If he wants to show you, if I could tell you what I saw coming out of you, it would be like a a science uh, fiction movie. It's like a stinking lion's head coming out of your chest, roaring. Do you sing? You can hold hold a tune? You need to roar. You need to roar. Golly. So what's your name? Yeah. Colin? Why are you afraid of what God told you to do? I'm just going to operate as a dad. Why are you afraid of what God told you to do? The steps of a righteous man have been ordered by God. Right? Do you want your life to be righteous? Then follow in his steps. He'll never lead you astray. It may not line up with your logic. Smith Wigglesworth, God told him to punch a man in the stomach. That doesn't line up with my logic. Or to slam somebody against the wall or to spit in somebody's eye. But he's God. He's in heaven. He does as he pleases. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to step out of your seat and walk all the way around these chairs as an act of obedience that you're going to obey God in the steps he's called you to. All the way around. All the way around. Come on. I'm in. Was that weird? Do you love me? You have to. You don't have to like me, but you have to love me. (laughs) So, last night, Apostle James Fortune was all in half of what I thought the Lord wanted me to say. And then the Lord began to call an audible. Do you know that God can do that? God's giving out blueprints. He's giving out playbooks. He talks to me in sports because I coached varsity football for 24 years, pastored at the same time, played college ball. And so he talks to me sometimes in sports. But when he uses someone who doesn't know anything about sports to prophesy over you, about how God will give you a playbook and that you'll know how to call an audible and you're looking at someone like, you don't even know how to spell the word audible and you're you're speaking that over me? So, know what an audible is? God always has a plan to counteract what the enemy's trying to throw at you. And so, even last night, powerful, powerful service. Apostle James brought an amazing word, teaching about the apostolic. I'm like, Lord. He said, no, you're going to build off of it. We're going to, you're going to do this. I'm like, okay, okay. So, Prophet Craig, last night, this has been going on for a few weeks in my heart and my spirit. And then I saw it here last night. There are literally mantles swirling around and flying around this room. The last two weeks, I've just seen mantles flying around and no one going after them. No one saying, I want that mantle. Rivers flowing out of people's lives. Rivers and mantles. We just had a dear woman of God that was in, that was in our church that we just got excommunicated from. But she was 
the crisis, she was the Christian crisis center in the food pantry in our parish, we have parishes in Louisiana. There's nothing she wouldn't do for anybody. And her and I caused a lot of trouble because we didn't go, we didn't fit everyone's mold. And when she passed away the other day, my wife said, who's going to take her mantle of servanthood to feed the homeless and the hungry, to clothe the folks, to provide the things? Who's going to pick up that mantle? So there's mantles. Everyone wants this. You don't want this one. Because every demon in hell comes after this one. And they're in the church. Don't be afraid of it, sir. Whatever it is God's called you to do. I think I know. I'm going to ask you in a little bit, little bit. Don't leave early. <clears throat> what are you laughing at? I'm going to save it. <laughs> ha. Man, we could really go all over the place. <laughs> Jesus. In him we live and move and have our being. In him we live and move and have our being. He's doing something right now. Don't sit there and think that I don't have something to say. I got plenty to say. I'm just not wanting to get ahead of him. Just drink it in, drink him in, drink it in, drink it in. There's two weapons against you tonight. Some of you are dealing with two weapons against you. I mentioned this to Prophet Craig in the back room. I didn't know I was going to say it right now. There's two weapons, shame and guilt. Shame and guilt. Shame and guilt's robbing you from going forward. Shame and guilt's robbing you from going to that next place with the Lord. That's got to die right now in Jesus' name. Just lift up your hands. If you're struggling with shame and guilt, even if you're not, lift up your hands. You're going to shake that off of you. You're going to shake that off of you. There's no shame. No shame. There's no guilt. No shame. No guilt. It doesn't matter what happened in your last season. This is a new wineskin era. This is a new wineskin era. 
You can't look back. Any man who looks, puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Yeah, come on. Shame's going now in Jesus' name. Shame's going now in Jesus' name. We curse shame and guilt in Jesus' name. You don't live at that address anymore. You live at the address called freedom and deliverance. Freedom and deliverance. Burn the plow. Burn the plow. Burn the plow. My God, he's doing something right now in Jesus' name. Oh! Sometimes people think that guilt and shame is only because you did something in your mind, you think that because it was something awful. Do you know how many people that attempt to do ministry and feel like they made a mistake and they messed up and they walk around with guilt and shame because they feel like they failed? You only fail if you stop getting up. I'm in a new season of my life where for the first time since 1999, I'm not a senior pastor of a church. The Lord launched my wife and I out into traveling. I'm 50 years old. You don't do that at 50. You don't start something new. At, I'm a grandpa. I can look at it and say I failed or I can look at it and say, I didn't fail nothing. I got promoted. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Guilt and shame. The enemy will attack you with that. He will attack you with that around every corner. Jesus. All right. Thank you, Lord. Mm. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jesus. For those of you taking medicine, it's almost nine o'clock. I want to honor Prophet Craig and Pastor Lauren. You know, when I, as I was pastoring, I always, and I still do, counted an extreme honor to be trusted with the anointing of the house, to stand behind the holy pulpit of God. Because people who God has given a ministry to. God's given them the great task of stewarding what he desires. And so whenever in 2020, when I met Prophet Craig, I hadn't met Pastor Lauren yet, but we, I'd heard of him. The Lord has spoke to me in 2019, November 18th, 2019, that he was going to start identifying the remnant and that he was going to start networking, using me to network with nameless and faceless individuals and that I was not to put limitations on age or experience but when he highlighted them to me, I was to connect with them. I've never told you this. And so Facebook says a lot about people, whether you want to believe it or not. The whole world's watching you through social media. That's why you want to post stupid stuff. You're going to get stupid stuff. Go to my TikTok. All it is is Jesus. 
Go to my Instagram, all it is is Jesus. Go to my Facebook pages, all it is is Jesus. And my grandkids and my family. Because all that's Jesus too. (laughs) But the Lord highlighted Prophet Craig to me. We had him come. And man, we got drunk. When you drank with somebody, we became drinking buddies. Right? I, was, I saw a picture the other day where I was holding you up at the altar because you were uh, stumbling over. <laughs> when, what's good about the Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost party like that is you have a holdover, not a hangover. Right? And then I found out that his wife loves to drink. And we drank from the same bar. <laughs> and I've never, they've never given me a headache. But we are, we're family. And we're family, and uh, anytime he comes, we'll put him in a hotel if he wants, but we have a house. We are, we are empty nesters. Hallelujah. <laughs> and so we, uh, like, come on, just come and stay. And yeah, so it's amazing. We've stayed up late at night, and it's so I honor you guys. Thank you for the invitation. Such an honor to be here and meet everyone. I haven't met everyone, but just to be here. And I honor you guys. Come on, can you can you appreciate our worship team? <clears throat> my my son said, Dad, you've got to meet these 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 amazing worship folks named Danny and Ashley. Yeah, worship folks. And because I'm going somewhere with that. They're not worship folks. They're psalmists. They're prophetic. They drip with the oil from heaven. And I'm so sick and tired of professional entertainment who can get up and run a set to hell with a set. God's tired of sets. He's got one song. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And if songs don't, if songs don't entertain him, I don't want it. Amen. To hell with a set. Can I say that? Okay. I'm telling you, I, since January 12th, I feel freer than I've ever felt in my life. <laughs> I, prophet, I said ass Sunday in church, and they're like, like it's in the Bible, it's King James. <laughs> but they're like, can you say that? <laughs> you guys ready? All right. Stay standing. Open your Bibles. To Judges chapter 2. After I pray, you can stop playing. Because if you keep playing, I'm going to keep flowing in other stuff. (laughs) Judges chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. We're going to stay in Judges 2, and then we're going to jump over to Judges 21 in a little bit. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochum, And he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their God shall be a snare to you. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept. And they called the name of that place Bochum, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. Mighty God, Jehovah, we honor you. Our Father, which is in heaven, we give you praise and honor. There is none like you. None like you. You are in this room. You are here very strongly tonight. 
And Lord, no one will leave from this place tonight the same. No one will leave the same. God, you're going to turn each and every one of us inside out. And Lord, there's going to be mantles that people are going to walk away with in this place tonight. But before we take mantles, Holy Spirit, there's work that you desire to do. And so, with our hands lifted up, we say, Father, do everything and anything you desire to do in me. I am yours, and you are mine. And I submit, and I surrender to your perfect will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you guys for uh, this amazing, amazing presence that's here tonight. <clears throat> Prophet Craig and uh, Pastor Lauren, aside from the honey and the fire, spice, last night when I was laying on the floor, I literally saw arrows being dipped in oil, lit on fire, and then you pulling the string and releasing it. And so I was like, Lord, what is this? He said, this house, this, this ministry that drips with spice, sweet spice, oil, honey, hot sauce, all of that together, that you're literally, the people you're raising up, and even with this school of ministry, they're like arrows in your quiver. Pew. Pew. So that means when he gets ready to launch you, don't resist it. Because this will always be home. Amen? Amen. So I pray that you receive that because I was like, whoa. One of the things that uh, my wife and I will be married this summer, let's see, 1994, no, 1996 to now, so 28 years, right? Am I doing my math right? Yeah. Yeah, 28 years of marriage. On our 25th anniversary, we were in Prescott, Arizona, and the Lord gave me a dream. We were in a cabin. Airbnb cabin in the mountains in Prescott, Arizona. It was beautiful. No one could see us. We had a, a blast. And But I woke up from this dream, and in this dream, all the states of the Gulf Coast was flashing in red. And above the states flashing in red, read these words, Gulf Coast outpouring and awakening. I got up and I went and I sat on the front porch of that cabin. I said, Lord, what are you showing me? And then he began to show me waves of fire and glory hitting the the coastline of the Gulf Coast, wave after wave. And then it's spreading all the way up north. All right, Lord, what are you doing? I came home and I've... I've prayed over all these states, but then one of the one of the men of God who's on our apostolic council last year he said he he spoke over my life and he said God's up to now you've had keys. He said, but the Lord is now giving you one master key for the Gulf Coast mandate. So one of our intercessors who was not in that service, she had moved away to San Antonio and now has since God called her back to be an intercessor for us. And said, Miss Barbara, if you're watching right now, God bless you. She, I had told her that I knew that the Lord this last year sometime wanted me to visit every state in the Gulf Coast region from Texas to Florida, Arkansas and Georgia. So I did, but I didn't know when. And then a friend called and asked me to come and preach for him in Gulf Shores, Alabama in December. And I accepted. I said, okay, yeah, I'll come. And so I told my wife, I said, this is a great time. I can leave. I can start in Texas because this was specific. The Lord said, I want you to stand on the shoreline of every, every state along the Gulf Coast. And so I came 
I started my journey on that Monday, and I went down to uh, Belmont and got somewhere down there on the beach where I wasn't supposed to be. But prior to this, this intercessor, Miss Barbara, she came and she gave me, she said, the Lord told me to give you this, and I've got it out in my Jeep. I should have brought it in. But it was a big skeleton key. She said, the Lord said to give you this key. And I, was, I started weeping because I remembered what Papa Bill had said to me. God's getting, God has given you keys, but now he's giving you a master key. And so I took that master key and I took my shofar and I stood on the shoreline of every state between here and Florida, declared the word of the Lord, prayed scripture, held out the key, and then looked like a stinking Tinkerbell blowing the shofar in Jesus' name. <laughs> I'm not the greatest at blowing that shofar, but if he says do it, you do it. And so I was really good at doing that because most of the places there was not anybody around until I got to Mississippi. I'm walking out on the shorelines of Mississippi and I'm carrying my cute shofar. It's got a nice little back thing that looks like a man purse. And I'm walking out there carrying this key. I'm like, Lord, you see all these people around? Are you going to obey me? Yeah, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, I said, declare. Open your mouth. You have a mandate. But Lord, I said, declare. If you don't do it, I'll use someone else. Okay, I will do it. Yes, sir. So I did. And the dad and the kids all stopped and looked at me. And I praised the Lord, and I left. <laughs> So, why am I telling you that? Do I think I have ownership of the Gulf Coast? No, I know that the Lord has me on a journey. He's removed me from the pastorate so that I can accomplish this mandate that's now on my life in a greater place, at a greater level. Does that mean I won't go any other places other than these states? No, I will. I'm leaving April 10th for Africa, for Kenya, to <laughs> preach a crusade and do a pastor's conference, and so it's going to be amazing. But even as I go, my home and main focus will be the Gulf Coast. Why do I say that? Because you've got to know tonight, and this is what we're going to deal with, mandates, right? And mantles. Mandates and mantles. That's not the title. I'll give you the title in a minute because you can't have a mandate and a title until you do what the title is. But every one of you have a mandate on your life and there is a mantle that God desires to give you to accomplish it, and you have to hear it from someone in the fivefold. I didn't get very many amens on that, right? You have to. Why? Because if you were here last night, I told you we're going to build, we're going to go from glory to glory. We're going to build off of what Apostle James Fortune spoke on last night, and now we're just going to go a little bit further. In our scripture, we read pretty much, a, you almost see where America's at. We have this thing going on in our country today. Do you understand that we're living in a time of extreme anarchy? We're living in a time of extreme anarchy, but we also have to understand that God's original plan is still God's original plan. We think this is something new. No, God is reintroducing us to what we've gotten away from from the day of Constantine on to this point in time. Study his, go and study church history. Look up Constantine. Look up all that. Thank you. If I, if I do that, I'm going to choke on it. But not only do we have extreme anarchy in our country, we have extreme anarchy in the church. Here in Judges 2, 
God had reminded them of how he brought them out of Egypt and then told them that he would not break his covenant with them. And he gave them instructions. And they didn't heed his voice and they didn't obey. Extreme anarchy. They were disobedient and now they are to live with thorns in their sides. How, how did they so quickly forget the Red Sea? I mean, that massive river, that massive Red Sea, that massive thing just parted and they walked across on dry land. How have you so, so soon forgotten your great victory? Has anybody got a testimony? Why do we forget what God did? Do you think that what God did one time is just a one-time thing? No, this journey is called for us to go from glory to glory. Amen. Not glory to glory or story. To, it's from glory to glory. How did they soon forget the release from slavery and captivity? And, but there was, because they forgot because there was anarchy in the camp. Makes you wonder why great moves of God have ever died. I love to study revival history. I love it. I just met a man, Dr. Mark Van Gundy. He lives in London, but he's moving back to Wales. God told him to go back to Wales. And he told me, he said, Jack, I want you to come to Wales when I get over there. And I was like, I would love to come to Wales because if you've ever studied Wales, you know that the Hebrides revival came out of Wales. Duncan Campbell. <coughs> but every move of God even on the day of Pentecost, after several hundred years, died because there was anarchy in the camp. But this move of God that's beginning to happen on this earth right now will only be sustainable if it's generational and if it's relational and we abolish the anarchy in the church. So if you do take notes, you can write that title down, Abolish Anarchy. What does anarchy mean? I'm glad you asked. Let's go to school, okay? Anarchy defined is absence or denial of any authority or established order. Apostle James mentioned last night about the water fountain that had a, an outer order sign on it because it was no longer working right and there was no water that would come from it. Anarchy is the absence or denial of any authority or established order. Further defined, a state of lawlessness or political disorder due to the absence of governmental authority. Why in America are we trying to defund the police? Anarchy. So that there is a denial, there's lawlessness going on. God... Is God a God of chaos? God's a God of order. He's the supreme governing force for us. Why do we need the fivefold and full function today? Because it brings order. And the apostle, as you learned last night, was the thumb. I need, is there an apostle, another apostle here tonight? Anyone? I'm going to use you as, because you're, pro, you're prophet Craig, but you, you're going to walk in some apostolic stuff anyway. So come, come here, please, and help me do this. Watch this. This is what we have to abolish. How many of you have ever played the game Thumb Wars? One, two, three, four, I declare a thumb war. Well, guess what? We've been doing in the church for a long time. Here's the apostle. Here's the prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. But we got apostles competing against one another. And as we're competing against one another, we're constricting, we're putting pressure on these other four because I want to be bigger. I want to be stronger. I want the better, uh, the better platform. Come on. And so now we're not letting the other four operate, but when we take this and we go to this and we bring this in, now we get our covenant brothers and it doesn't matter what stream he is or what stream I am, we can run together this race that God laid out before us and we're remnant covenant relationship. 
But we have to abolish that anarchy. We have to abolish that stinking uh, competition. I don't care that you worship, you have a, you're greater at worship than our worship team. Who gives a rip? Who cares if you have the greatest bells and whistles in your ministry or you have this book or that book? Who cares? Yes, my name's the last name's Osteen, but I don't care what Joel Osteen has. I don't care. And I'm also not going to bash Joel Osteen because he's a stream. I can flow with it. I can flow with a stream that's promoting Jesus. Amen? Amen. Well, he don't preach on sin. How do you know? Have you been there? I've been to his services, and I saw seven altar calls. I saw people baptized in the Holy Spirit. I saw it with my own eyes. Don't put your mouth on another man or woman of God. Amen? We need to abolish anarchy. Let me ask you this question. Who's in charge of your life? Yeah, it's easy to say. But does God know who's in charge of your life? If you're saved and you know it, say amen. amen. That's always 100%. But do you know there's a difference between being saved and being born again? There's a lot of people who said a cute little sinner's prayer that are in hell right now because they're not truly born again. Because if you're born again, you're dead. You don't live of yourself. You've abolished every ounce of anarchy in your life. You are a new creation. All the old has passed away. Say abolish anarchy. Why are we doing that? Because there's mantles that the God wants to place on our lives tonight. There's mandates and mantles he wants to give, but he cannot put a mandate and a mantle on someone's life who is full of anarchy. We've got men and women of God standing on pulpits all over and all across this country who are so full of anarchy, God's been exposing them left and right and they've been take, he's been taking them out. You know, you've, if you watch, you see any news, he's, just getting, he's, he's threatening it and he's getting rid of it because he needs purity, holiness at this pulpit. Annihilate anarchy. We need the power of the Holy Ghost at work not just when we come together corporately and we shun die on time, a bow tie, we jump and dance. We need it in the bedroom. We need it when nobody's around. We need it when you go to your phone and you go to look at porn and you feel the conviction of the Holy Ghost. What the, what the Spirit starts, the Spirit finishes. We didn't come to finish what Jesus started. We come to start what he already finished. He didn't say on the cross, it started. No, he said it's finished. Now he's been waiting for us to pick up the mandate to, to start what he already finished. So let's go back to uh, Judges 2. Pick up verse 6. We're going to read a little bit. We're going to read the rest of the chapter. If you didn't read your Bible today, you're going to get it in right now. When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went, to, went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land, and the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had, been, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years old. And they buried him with the boundaries, within the boundaries of his inheritance, in Timnath, Harris, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gash. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation. Everyone say, arose another generation. Arose another generation. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. I'm so excited that there is a generation right now on this earth called Gen Z that God is awakening. Yes. Praise God for Asbury. Praise God for what's going, what happened, what's going on at Baylor and some of these other college campuses all across our country. Yes. Praise the Lord. But do you know, my sons went to uh, Asbury. 
they went there to uh, see what was going on, thank you, a few days after it broke out, and they called me and they said, Dad, this isn't like some of the power and the, the presence like we've experienced, but there's something here far greater than we've ever seen, and it's the pure hunger and devotion that these young people have. My sons are Gen Z. And then my son said, Dad, what is really missing from this wasn't the word of God. It wasn't a covering of leadership in, their, in that place. That's what everyone accuses it of. But my son said, Dad, if there's not some true fathers that show up to help steward this, hello? If there's not some true fathers apostolic leaders that will step in and help steward this, not take over. Because a true apostolic father is going to push his children in front of him. And so when they told me that, I'm like, Lord, where are the fathers? Instead, you had some big name preachers and big name worship people calling Asbury. Hey, can we come and lead worship for you? Can we come and preach for you? No, you don't need a mic. Sit down. Prophet Apostle James said last night, the chiefs and the eagles. That was so good. It was powerful. But what happened before the Grammys started all of this? Who remembers the NFL player Hamlin who died on national television? in a football game. And the whole country started praying and we saw this NFL football player resurrected to life not once but twice on national television. Then a few days later, the Grammys won a four-minute worship session to Satan. And then three days later, Asbury breaks out. And I'm telling you, what happened at Asbury is still going on, and it's just, it doesn't have to, can I tell you that what God starts, he finishes? I just said that, I'm going to say it again. And if you think that what God has started here is only for here, you're in the wrong place because it's got to go, it's got to go. It's got to be those arrows. It's got to be those arrows. It's got to be those arrows. It's got to be you taking the mandate and the mantle and going, man of God. That's what it's got to be. From Judges chapter 2, I'm not, you go and read the rest. Verse 25, go to chapter 21 real quick. Chapter 21, verse 25. Oh, I'll jump to Ruth, hallelujah. You need to underline this one in your Bible. Judges chapter 1, verse 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's anarchy. So from Judges 2 to Judges 21, there's some things we're going to look at tonight to abolish anarchy. First thing that we see is that there was no king. You can't be my pastor or my apostle or my prophet. Nobody can tell me what to do. God tells me only. That's rebellion. And that's as the sin of witchcraft. How many of you practice witchcraft? If you're rebelling against the leader that God placed over you, you're practicing witchcraft. Well, I'm not doing seances. No, but you're rebelling against the authority that God placed over you. You will never be over what God places under you until you've learned to submit what God has placed over you. Amen? Amen? Check it out. I'll be 50 in December. Prophet Craig, how old are you? 29. There's, when I come into this house, age is not a barrier. I submit and have to come up under the authority of this house. And any man or woman of God that steps in here and tries to strut their stuff and says to Prophet Craig, well, you're just 29 years old. I've been doing this, for, I've been doing this longer than you've been alive. They need to be shown the door. Yeah. 
I'm going to be with this great man of God on Sunday morning. I'm going to come in under his church and up under his leadership and under his anointing and I'm going to submit to his authority in the house. I've trained my sons. If they tell you you got 15 minutes, you better be done in 15 minutes. Period. If they tell you you've got your free liberty, you, you let the Lord, don't preach past the Holy Ghost. There was no king. So when, because there was no king, there was, they were defenseless. There was no one to defend the rights of the poor. I promise you, there is no one that prays for ACF more than this man. You wake up every day and you may not have ACF on your mind, but he has it on his heart every single day. He goes to bed with some of your faces. Him and his wife wake up with your families. So watch your mouth and watch your steps. And if you're here waiting for them to promote you and if you're using them as a springboard, can I just help you right now? I will open the door for you. There was no one to defend the rights of the poor. There was no one, no leadership to stop the fighting. There was no leader to take the responsibility to promote godly lifestyles. There's been times I've been called to people's house because they've lost it. And I've stepped in by invitation. What they're inviting is not the man. They're inviting the anointing. They're inviting the authority. And so when I step in and I'm telling a grown man who's acting a fool to shut his mouth and sit down because he's out of line, you can't talk to me like that in my house. Do you want to go outside? What happens when you get invited into a, a true leader is going to fight to defend you? But you won't allow it if you have anarchy in your life. Anyone who refuses discipline, anyone who refuses discipline will never grow in Jesus' name. There must be a leader. Say that with me. There must be a leader. I don't care who you voted for in the, in the, in the presidential race, but right now we don't have a leader. We have people trying to dictate what our country should be doing. Anarchy. We have things being presented to us, except this and except that. I'm sorry. I'm not going to let, if I have a granddaughter, I'm not going to let her go into a bathroom where a man's going to come in there and stand there and pee right beside her. I came from the ghetto. I came out of the ghetto, but the ghetto hadn't all came out of me. And you want to go into a bathroom with a, my granddaughter? I'm going to lay hands on you. Amen. Boys have pee-pees. Girls don't. There should be no confusion. Period. When I was born, the doctor smacked me on the butt. And I started crying, and he said, congratulations, you have a boy. Period. Physical evidence. There must be a leader. People don't want a my way or the highway leader, though. There must be an Ephesians 2, 19 and 20 type of leader. You heard it last night, you're going to hear it again. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens meaning you're no longer just wandering around doing whatever you want. Come on. You don't, that means you don't, you're not wandering around where you belong. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. There needs to be a leader, a leader that will establish order, a leader that will say no to chaos, someone who values people. 
the church needs to be that leader. Who's the church? Everyone say, I am the church. You want to shift the culture as he was speaking of last night? When I go to Africa on April 10th, I fly out April 10th and I land April 11th. But when my feet hit the soil of Nairobi in Kenya, when I step on that soil, I immediately have to embrace the African culture. If I go through customs, well, I'm Jack Osteen, I'm Apostle Jack Osteen, and I am this and I am that, and I demand you just let me through. They're going to put me in African jail. <laughs> but when I get to the place where I'm doing this pastor's conference and I'm given this mic and I'm told to take my liberty, now I'm introducing them to not the culture of Jack. I'm introducing them to kingdom culture, which trumps all culture. Kingdom culture trumps every other culture in the world. It's a universal language. It doesn't say seek first African kingdom or seek first the animal kingdom. It says seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these other things will be added. You and I are the church. And you may be here tonight and you'll say, well, not everybody's called to lead. I beg to differ. Does your head itch? I scratched my head. Look, she's, uh, I just led her to scratch her head. See? See? Come on, do this. You got them braids too tight. <laughs> Everyone's called to be a leader. And every single one of you have led somebody. Whether you like it or not, you have led someone. Good or bad. The church is the hope of the world. And you and I are the church. And Jesus said, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. Where's the flow? Check this out. Everyone's, when you get into, polit or get into debates on theology with some camps, well, the prophet Joel, that prophecy was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost when it said that he'll pour out his spirit on all flesh. No, how's it? What did God make out of dirt? Man, woman, out of rib? Is everyone in this room flesh? Out of your belly will flow what? So when he says, when the prophecy in Joel 2 and then Acts 2, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, he's waiting for you to pour yourself out on others around you. It is not fair that you get and take in everything that God gives you and then don't pour it out on someone else. If this fleshly earthen body has the spirit of God and I don't pour it out on my brother, I'm a spiritual couch potato and I'm just getting fat. That messes with somebody's theology a little bit. Are you not to present yourselves as a living sacrifice? Yes, yes. Are you not to allow, are you to go to the Lord and say, pour me out as an offering? Pour out my life. My life is not my own. Come to Lake Jackson. Um, Apostle Jack, will you come? And I really feel like God wants you to come. Sure. Why? To be poured out. But we go to conference after conference to fill, to fill, 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 fill. There's nothing wrong with it. I do it. But I'm telling you right now, YouTube can't do what the Holy Ghost can. Amen? There's, you're, you, you're here and I'm glad you are. But if you don't spend as much time in your prayer closet as you spend here, what are you pouring out? Amen? 
We must rise up in the authority and the power of the Holy Spirit, abolish the anarchy in our own lives. We are the church. Abolish that anarchy and allow him to pour us out on a dry and thirsty land. What if you are the highway in the wilderness that he wants to put in there? What if you are the, the river in the desert, deserted places? What if at the job that you hate and you rebuke every time you go, what if you are the one that God placed there for such a time as this? Come on. Do you understand that the fivefold functions in the marketplace? The fivefold doesn't always have to have the mic and preach behind a pulpit. There's apostles that are Christians and they're, they're starting new businesses for the kingdom. They're affecting every area. And pastor here, he, pre he, he teaches school. He's affecting the education system. Hallelujah. My wife is a banker. She's a manager of a bank and a loan officer. She's affecting that area of influence. Some of you got called to start businesses and you go, I don't know about all that. This inflation. I'm telling you, there's no inflation with the kingdom of God. Yeah. My daddy owns the cattle of a thousand hills. Yeah. He's not broke. I really felt that during, the, during worship tonight that some in this room are fighting the spirit of lack. And if you didn't give in the offering, look, you're not, you're not putting groceries on my table. Does it look like I'm hurting for groceries? <laughs> Don't laugh. I've lost 40 pounds and I've kept it off. <laughs> Amen. But because <clears throat> you got to take care of your body. You can't run this race God's called you to run if you're not taking care of your, 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 your temple. So uh, I'm still in a, pro I'm in a work in process and uh, a process in work. Yeah, that too, yeah. <clears throat> Our lack of leadership today is really helping the anarchy of today's issues. We may have different levels of leadership, but you still need to lead. I know you. Right? Yeah, I know you. You're what, 19, 18, 17? You're called to lead. I sure did. Yep. But well, I'm telling you again, in case you forgot it. Because <laughs> I forgot it. No, I didn't. <laughs> You're called to lead. Young people, this isn't leading. That's not leading. That's not the leading that God desires. Stop twerking on TikTok. Abolish the anarchy of twerk. Told you I'm just going to be a dad. My nieces... They're tall, long legs, and they look like they jumped off the house to get into their shorts. So I had on some basketball shorts. I rolled them up way high. I said, let's go to the mall together. No, Uncle Jack, I'm not going with you anywhere like that. Why? That's gross. I'm like, I may not have the tone that you have. I used to. I don't, I don't flex like I used to. But if you're ashamed of me to wear it like that, why won't you cover it up? Young ladies, let me tell you, you are not a billboard. Guys, you need to kill your eyes. Don't bounce them, kill them. It's a woman of God you're looking at. There was no king. Everyone did their own thing. We have this have your own way mentality. For 40 years, Burger King had a slogan called have it your way. But did you know in 2014 they changed their slogan? Yeah. In 2014, Burger King changed their slogan from have it your way to be your way. 
be your way. This is why we got Mickey and Goofy kissing each other in June at, at Disney World during gay month. Be your way. Taco Bell adopted a slogan that says, live moss, live more. Both chains adopted these slogans in an attempt to be more hip and create a non-corporate attitude to gain, to gain customers. In fact, Burger King is stated to say the following. People should follow, people should live how they want anytime. It's okay to not be perfect. Self-expression is most important, and it's our differences that make us individuals instead of robots. Burger King. Is it okay not to be perfect? It's okay not to be perfect, but it's not okay to, content, to not to seek the perfected one. Because in him, he said, be perfect as I am perfect. What does that mean? Be holy as I am holy. As I'm being, as be perfect as he is perfect, that means I am being perfected by the perfecter. The author and the perfecter of my faith. So, we, we've adopted a lifestyle that says, do what you want, live how you want, it's your life. So, where is God in your life? I said earlier, where if you're saved and you know it, say amen, and everyone said amen. Well, where's the evidence of the God in your life? Or do we see more anarchy? I'm not trying to beat anybody up. But the Lord said, come do business. Build off of what we built on last night because tomorrow night you're going to get wrecked. Where is God in your life? Where's God in your phone? Where's God in your checkbook? Where's God in your bills? Where's God in your lifestyle? Where's God in your TV? Oh, you're being legalistic. No, being holy. I'm sorry. You probably have no business watching Yellowstone or whatever it's called. You have no business. Is it called Yellowstone? You have no business watching Yellowstone. Don't even look it up if you don't know none. Some of y'all, some of y'all looked at me like, Ooh. <coughs> where is God in your self-expression? <coughs> where is God in your opinion? I don't see anywhere in the Bible where I'm entitled to have an opinion. What I do see is I have been crucified with Christ. It is therefore no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. So that means I'm dead to my opinion. And you can't offend a dead man. Where is he? Is he visible to others around you? My 20-year-old son will be 21 this weekend this coming up weekend, he was in Arkansas getting ready to, on his way to go preach somewhere. And when he got out of his vehicle to pump gas, this woman, addicted to meth, come up to him and said, my God, you're a man of God, aren't you? I could tell. And he presented the gospel to her right there at the gas pump. He didn't say a word. He got out of his vehicle. Where is God visible in your life? I'm telling you, when you walk into a room, you should shift the atmosphere. I don't care where you work. I don't care how toxic your family is. When you walk into the room, it should change. You don't change, but the things around you should change. Praise God when you show up, they stop cussing. Praise God that when you show up, they stop the dirty talk. Praise God they change the channel when you come from upstairs, downstairs. Praise God. It's not because they're afraid of what you'll say. They're afraid of what you carry. When you've abolished the anarchy, you don't care about opinions of man. You just walk. 
I'm telling you right now in Jesus' name, if you will abolish the anarchy in your life, every door will be open like them automatic doors at Walmart. You'll just walk and the sensory of the Holy Spirit will just open it for you. Boom, 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 boom. It's not because I'm cocky. It's not because I'm an arrogant fool. It's because I'm anointed. I've got a mandate. I've got a mantle. And I've abolished the anarchy in my life. No strings, no strings. He's, is he visible to others around you? You shouldn't have to tell people you're an apostle. Your gift announces you. You shouldn't have to tell people you're a man or woman of God. This It's not this little light of mine. I, I, that song's cute. No, it's a freaking spotlight. Amen? Let it shine. More, they, 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 in judges, they had no morals. Where's the morals in our country? The seeker friendly, seeker sensitive, little pansy, pathetic preaching isn't cutting it. I call it PAP. Hashtag PAP. Pansy, apathetic preachers. I wanted to call it something else, but my wife said no. <laughs> And I just went there. <laughs> Pansy, apathetic preachers. That's <laughs> PG version. We want to give TED Talks, seven steps to improve your marriage. Praise God for that. That's called discipleship. Preach the word. Preach the word. There's no morals. It's okay to tell, preach that women should be modest. Yeah. I don't care if you wear ripped jeans or skinny jeans or whatever. Just cover your butt. Yeah. There should be no cleavage in the house of God. I'm serious. I can't. I can't. Pastor Kevin, there's been times you go to churches and there's some women, you don't want them to give you a hug. <laughs> I'm serious. You give them the side hug. They're thirsty. And it's a trap for you as a man or woman of God. So you've got to abolish the anarchy and don't even entertain that nonsense. Church has become an option for people. When you make church an option for your kids, then it no longer is a, an issue of importance for them when they get older. I told you I coached for 24 years. Both my sons, Jeremiah, my oldest, could have went and played Division I basketball, walked away from basketball, his senior year in high school, because he said, Dad, I'm afraid if I go and play, it will become an idol in my life and I won't pursue the will of God for me. I still get emails today for him. In eighth grade, he was in the top 75 of the United States. We lived in New England. We did the, I coached him. I coached his basketball teams. And then when it came to AAU, I didn't coach. But this is what I told the coach. He'll play for you. He'll work his tail off for you. But if you call a practice on a Wednesday night, he won't be there. If we're in a, if we're in a tournament and on Saturday night you win the semifinal and you're in the finals on Sunday during church hours, he won't be there. But he will give it, your all, give it his all the rest of the time. So... We're pastoring in Providence, Rhode Island. We planted a church in the inner city of Rhode Island, Providence. We're in this tournament up around Boston area. They win the game Friday night. They, they win the, the next game Saturday morning. They win a game on Saturday evening that put them into the semifinals at 8 o'clock on Sunday morning. Coach said, Mr. Osteen, are, are you going to let your son play? 
I said, I'm going to bring him. When that game's over, we're going back to Providence. One hour drive. If we win, the championship's at 3 o'clock. Church will be over around 12, 1 o'clock. We'll be here at game time. So guess what? Jeremiah and I, we were church planters. We had to set up and tear down every week at a, a like a, it was called American Lithu Lithuanian Club. I got Jeremiah up at 5 a.m., hit McDonald's, breakfast on the way. We got to that game. He played that 8 o'clock game, scored 27 points. We turned around. We shook hands with everybody. We got in the vehicle. We drove back to Providence, Rhode Island. I got up, and I preached the word of God. When the service was over, I said, like, hey, y'all take care of everything. We're out. Jeremiah, we got to go. And we drove all the way back to Boston, grabbed something on our way through, and we got there, and they won the championship, and then, got, then their whole team went to the SPN Center because of that championship. Jeremiah scored 32 points in that game, shut down their number one guy, but that coach said, Pastor Osteen, I can't believe you did that. I said, I'm a man of my word. So when parents tell me, well, we can't because our kids have sports, you're talking to the wrong person. You're talking to the wrong one. I'm not going to get in your pity party. Your child has about a 30% chance to make it in the pros. But they have a 100% chance of burning in hell. You can teach them to throw, dribble, pass, catch. But if you don't teach them how to pray, cast out devils, and walk in authority and the anointing of the Holy Ghost, you're not raising up a man or woman of God. You're raising up a puppet who's given into anarchy. If people of God would stand up and stand on the morals of the, of the word of God and stand up on righteousness, we would see a better country and we would see a much powerful, more powerful church. Relationship with Jesus cannot be convenience. I'm sorry, if someone told you when you come to Jesus, it's going to get easier, they lied to you. All hell broke loose. Come on, it has, there has to be more. Come on, say that. There has to be more. There has to be more. If you will raise the standard in your life, you will abolish the anarchy of your soul. If you would establish your leadership in this life, I'm just going to say it. Any husband... Any husbands here? Raise your hand if you're a husband. Don't you dare let your, woman, your wife lead the house. Don't you dare. Men are called to be the spiritual leaders of their home. If your wife prays more than you, if your wife's in her word more than you, you're not leading your home spiritually. How are you loving her as Christ loved the church and she knows more scripture than you know? Oh. Sir, you've got to abolish the anarchy in your own life. Stop saying, bring me my beer, and you can say, bring me my Bible. <clears throat> I hope this is helping some people. If you would rise up in faith, rise up in power, in the Holy Spirit. Walk in a manner worthy of your calling. Take your relationship with Christ serious. Then you would annihilate the spiritual anarchy of your soul. You do all that, and only then will you really know the right direction. You do all that and annihilate that spiritual anarchy. Only then will you receive the mandate and the mantle that he desires for your life. You can be here tonight confused, not knowing what God wants you to do. There's a reason for that. There's anarchy in your soul. God is not confused with his direction for your life. You're following the wrong GPS, God's positioning system. Come on. You and I know that the anarchy in our society today is leading us in the wrong direction. Stand up, church. 
Amen? Why, when 2020 happened and COVID broke out, strip clubs were essential, liquor stores were essential, but the church was deemed non-essential because the church hasn't been essential in a long, long time. Whenever we were feeding 500, 600 families a day, we had people calling cops on us. I'm like, no. And the, the sheriff gave me a letter and said, Pastor, if you need to go across the state line, which it was closed, Louisiana and the border between Louisiana and Texas was closed, I'm going to give you a letter that gives you clearance so that you can go and get food if you run out here. Why? What, hap what that happens when you stand on the righteousness of God, you stand up and do something. It's time to stand up. If you're well, willing and ready to abolish the anarchy, it's time to stand up. In fact, I, would, I wonder if there's anybody that would stand up and give God some praise right now because you're tired of the anarchy in your own life. Come on. Stand up and take your place. Stand up and take your place. Now let me wrap this up. You can sit down. Y'all thought we were done? No, it just felt good, didn't it? Something else these people did in this scripture, in the, in the Bible here. Can I keep going? Here's, check this out. Good people did no thing. Good people did no thing. Nothing produces no thing. Paul said, this one thing I do, indicating that he did something. You don't have to do all the things that Prophet Craig and Pastor Lauren do, but you are called to do something. In fact, all the people that we lead and that follow us, I've told all of them, don't you dare try to keep up with me. You don't have my capacity. But you better be doing something. That means I may not can do a lot. But this one thing I can do. Billy Graham, you don't hear this story. Billy Graham led a crusade where a 72-year-old blind woman gave her heart to Jesus. And she, she, she answered the call of God and she said, Lord, there's not anything I can do. How can I spread the gospel? I'm 72 years old and I believe she was in a wheelchair if I remember the story right. <coughs> She's blind. She's praying. And the Lord spoke to her and said, you have a Braille telephone book. She went through the white pages and started in Braille calling every person that she could call. And she preached the gospel to over 2,000 people and led a majority of them to the Lord over the telephone as she never met them. You don't hear that story. You can do something. Amen? Yes. Brother James, it might be in a sound booth or it might be doing tech or whatever, but you can do something. Every single one of you in this room is called to preach the gospel to everybody. You may not be called to the office of one of the fivefold, but you're called to make a difference in this world. Do something. I wish people would do something today. People are railing. Their social media, people are just bashing each other all over the place. That is ineffective, and you're doing something for the kingdom of darkness and not the kingdom of God. Do something. Come, I tell you, as, as a pastor, I didn't hear this very often, but I got really excited when I did. Pastor, I'm just here to serve. Tell me what you need done. Make you fall out if somebody come up and said, Prophet, what, what can I do? I just want to be a servant. 
before I could ever stand behind a pulpit to preach in the, under the pastor that Pastor Darnell and I came up under, he, I would ask him, can I preach on Sunday nights? No. We had to learn how to clean toilets. Can I preach on Sunday nights? Nope. But the nursing home needs you down there to preach to them old people. You got 20, you got to go down there, you got to lead songs. You got to preach for what, 20, 25 minutes? And just about every time we went, even after the song service was over and you would get into your sermon, this one old lady sitting in there, she would just bust out, when the roll is caught up yonder. <laughs> and I'd have to stop. She forgot that we sang that song already. What was that? It was called character building. It was called, if you can't preach to the least of these, you, if you can't preach when no one's looking, you don't get to preach when everybody's eyes are on you. Do something. And so when, no, when, people, when, when people do nothing, no thing is established. And when nothing and no thing is done, guess what happens? God gets blamed. God gets ignored. And no one, no one wants to listen to him or obey him. This is why the world is freaking out right now by churches that are rising up and actually doing something. Wait a minute, you never did anything before, but now you're rising and you got a voice? Yeah, because he's awakening the sleeping giant. Remove the excuses. There's two words that limit you from doing what God's called you to do. Yes, but... Yes, I would do it, but I'm not qualified. Yes, I can, but I don't know how. You've said but so much, you might as well draw a crack down your forehead. <laughs> Remove the excuses. Everyone say, do something. do something. Turn to your neighbor and say, do something. Kill the lie, kill the lie that you believe. T tell me your name again. Colin, I told you I was going to come back to you. You have to kill the lie that you believe. You have to kill the voices that's been in your ear telling you that you can't. Kill those lies. Because you have 10 fingers, right? Check this out. Say this with me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know what that's called? Ten finger praise. <laughs> Remove the excuse. Kill the lie that you believe. So the next time any of you have an excuse, just start clapping. Clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. What am I doing? I've got my ten finger praise going on. I can do all things. What does all mean? All means all. There are things that you can't do, but my gosh, there are some things you can do. And tonight's a great night to start. I told you there's mantles flying around. There's mandates that he desires to give. Let me, let me share my heart with you for a second. Prophet Craig, I refuse to sit back, to pout. I refuse to sit back and pout and let the world go by. I refuse to shut up. I refuse to sit down. I refuse to back down. I refuse to be silenced. I refuse to do anything that man has tried to tell me to do because there is a fire inside these bones. There's a fire inside this heart. There was a call at the age of 16 that said you will preach the gospel and you will go into nations. There's a call. There's still a prophetic word that's still burning in my spirit and there's still sons and daughters that God's called me to raise up and to release that will go further than I've ever went. But that's okay. I'm still going to be found faithful. I'm still going to be found occupying and I'm still going to be found doing what he's called me to do when he returns. 
My dad died at 67 years old because he didn't listen to the doctor. I'm not going to go that way. I'm not going to die the way he died. I'm not going to go because of diabetes. I'm not going to go because of high blood pressure. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to die because I didn't take care of this body. I'm going to get this thing in shape because there's a still a race to run. There's still souls to be saved and I can't have any excuses in my life. Say amen. amen. But I've got to abolish the lie. I've got to kill the anarchy in my life. I will fight for racial reconciliation. I hate racism. It's demonic. I can't stand when they say pastor can't preach because she's a woman. You better get out of here. I'm going to stand up for people that are treated wrong. I was abused. My mom had five husbands. My dad, when he died, was married to his fourth wife. Praise God, we've been married 28 years. Why? Because we said we're abolishing the anarchy of divorce in this household. My sons have never known abuse. My sons never saw a daddy come home drunk. My sons never saw a daddy come home high or doing anything else. My sons never saw that. Did they see their mom and dad fight? Yeah, because they they my sons watched me kill the anarchy in my life right before their eyes. But my sons also watched me own it. That's where parents get it wrong. Let's have a parenting one-on-one class real quick. Don't act like you're all that in a bag of chips. Do as I say, not as I do. That's not in the Bible. Own your mistakes in front of them. Let them see you repenting. Let them catch you on your face. Let them hear you say, Daddy messed up. Will you forgive me, son? That's how you'll raise up men and women of God. I'll stand for righteousness. I will stand against pap, pansy, (laughs) apathetic preachers. Let me close with this. I think I'm closing. You know what that means? Nothing. (laughs) We were here till after midnight last night. Not that I'm trying to break records. Here, let me close my Bible. No pap, no pap. In the ghetto, they used to say no cap, but I say no pap. (laughs) I'm papa, not papa. (laughs) I'm going to give you the spiritual ingredients for true spiritual transformation. How many of you like to bake a cake? A good cake, a homemade from scratch. There's some good key ingredients. If you leave anything out, it's going to fall. It won't rise. It won't be good. Spiritual ingredients. Authority must take its place. Say that with me. Authority must take its place. Point yourself in the face and say, my authority must take its place. And your authority has to submit to the authority that God placed over you. It's called order. Spiritual, our authority must take its place. Authority must be established. It's no question you walk into this house. The hearts are the authority here. As they're submitted to the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Any husband, man in this room, if someone walked into your house and tried to take over, what you going to do? You're going to fight. I had a man in, in Louisiana. He uh, was in the church. He was doing good. Then he got back into the witchcraft he was in. I called him on it. He got really mad at me, cussed me on the phone. And he said, I'm coming to your house. I'm going to kill you. I said, I'm, let me send you a drop pin so you don't get lost. <laughs> and I said, when you get here, there's something waiting for you. And then when I got off the phone, 
I called Jason Horton, who works for the sheriff's department and attends our church. I said, Jason, Ray just threatened to kill me, and I've got a, um, an AR-74, AR and I've got some other guns, and when he steps on my property, I'm going to shoot him in the leg. He said, Pastor, if you do, please do it. Make sure it's in your garage. What was happening at that moment? You're not crossing the authority of my house. There's not a man in this room that wouldn't fight for your wife or your home or your, or your family. Are you married? Did you have a mama? If somebody came and started making fun of your mama, you slap them? <laughs> your mama cooks good cookies. <laughs> Isn't that interesting when you go, your mama, you're like... Because when something threatens, that authority rises up. Why are we allowing the authority of hell to trump the authority of the believer? The blood of Jesus covers you. Amen? Authority must be established. In Judges, they had no authority, they, so they didn't have revival. The only way this revival, this move of God is happening and will continue to happen is if the authority is in its right place and it's stewarded the correct way. We must know what is right and we must do what is right. Do you know who you are in Jesus Christ? I can walk into places that I shouldn't because I know goodness and mercy are following me. I know that his presence has went before me. I know that I'm blessed in the city. I'm blessed in the field. I know that I'm blessed when I come and I'm blessed when I go. I know that. In knowing, you also have to know where you can't go. Because that's now called cocky and being arrogant. You have to use discernment. And authority, and when it comes to authority, you've got to know when to flex and when to go low. This is why so many men and women of God get in trouble. You don't know who I am, bless God. Because you're flexing and it's not the time to flex, it's time to go low. But we've got men and women of God in the country, in our country today, when they've been called to flex, they've stayed low because no one's ever told them that they could rise up. This is why women, preachers, are afraid to boldly declare what God's told them to boldly declare because man's told them their place. You're supposed to be in the kitchen, sweetheart. I can give this mic to her, and I promise you she'll preach the paint off these walls. And I've never heard her preach. I don't have to. You get your spiritual authority. Who wants spiritual authority? We all need it. We all want it. I mean, let me tell you how you get it. It's not for sale. You get your spiritual authority by connecting daily with God. Jeremiah Osteen, Jonathan Osteen, didn't just happen to become Osteen by happenstance. They took on the last name and are fulfilling the legacy and the generational blessing because they spent time daily with their parents. You are a product of how you're raised. If you don't like how you've been raised, do something different. <clears throat> Submit to the spiritual authority that God has placed over you. Rise up in that spiritual authority. What's your name? Ricky, don't ever think that you're going to outgrow him. I know that, but I'm just helping everybody else too. Don't ever think that because you got a revelation that he didn't get, that you're now above him. He will, as you stay submitted under his leadership, 
God will elevate you so much higher. You'll go further and go places he hasn't went. About three years ago, I don't know if uh, some of y'all know my sons, but they get some insane revelation. Oh my God. I'm like, I have a master's degree in theology and don't have that kind of revelation. And I'm sitting in service. Pastor Kevin, I was jealous. I'm like, God, how in the world? Why'd you give that to them? And why couldn't I see that? And I wish I could tell you that the Lord said, well, that's okay, son. I'll help you out next time. No. It's Pastor Veronica. This is what the Lord said. Are you done crying? He said, I, why are you mad that I answered your prayer? I gave your sons a double portion of you and your wife. Why would you get upset if your son or daughter is doing better than you? Isn't that what you want? Some of you have told your kids, I want it better for you. I sacrificed so that you could have better. You've got to encourage those around you. You're still writing down the spiritual ingredients? You've got to encourage those around you. Check on each other. What's your name? Ashley. I don't know who knows Ashley, but if you hadn't seen Ashley for a while, check on Ashley. And if she's like, get out of my business, then that means she's got some anarchy. Can I tell you that you are called to get all up in everybody's grill? You are called to be your brother's keeper. I don't mean they got to be all in your business, but you can check on people, right? Become a spiritual recruiter. Do you think this ministry is going to grow just because you open the doors? Every single one of you are called to go and recruit for the, God, for the kingdom of God. We have to reestablish absolutes. In a world where there's no absolute truths, your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth, we have to reestablish the absolute truth of his word. This is the standard. Not Steve Harvey, not Maury Pop, whatever his name, not any of those. This is the standard. <clears throat> Don't you dare do anything halfway either. Do you serve a halfway God? Don't you dare do anything halfway. Don't serve God halfway. Don't you worship halfway. Don't you give halfway. You come in all the way. This past Sunday, one of, one of our sons, spiritual sons, lives in Waco now, came through. <clears throat> and I was preaching. I wasn't even done. And he come running to the altar, buried his head right here in my chest, and he said, I got to come all the way in. I got to stop playing. And I said, you're coming all the way this time. You don't give God part of your life. Because even, even a partial piece of your life is still disobedience. And that is spiritual anarchy. Don't you dare settle for anything but the best. You know what I love about what you guys got going on right here? You're doing the best you can with what you've got. And as you're faithful and doing the best that you can with what you've got, when promotion comes and he graduates you to something better and greater, you're going to be so appreciative of it because you will never forget the place of small beginnings. Amen. Back when it was just you two singing together, when nobody knew. You're about, 
you just put out what? Your first, second? Second album. I didn't know you two years ago. That doesn't mean anything. And it's not that you do it to be known. But if you were faithful when you just started and you did the best you could with what you had. You sang melodies to heaven that these folks had never heard you sing. And because it pleased him, he's expanding you. He's expanding you. I dare you. I double dog dare you to fully engage in what God's doing. I double dog dare you. You know what that means? That means I'm doing it too. I double dog dare you to abolish every ounce of anarchy in your life. And I double dog dare you to grab a mandate and a mantle in this place tonight and don't leave this place without some clarity and some direction for what God has called you to do.